So as we open, can you please turn in your Bibles to Proverbs chapter 29. Proverbs 29. So back in October, I was preparing to fill in for my father, the pastor, uh, the first week of November. So if you're like me and with your daily devotions or your morning devotions, you probably read a chapter of Proverbs as they correspond to the day of the month. So I'm reading my daily devotions, and uh, obviously it was on the 29th, because we're here in Proverbs chapter 29, and a verse hit me. And when that verse hit me, I was thinking, well, you know what? I've been preparing this sermon for the first week of November, but I don't know if I want to do that one. This verse hit me, and I was thinking, well, maybe that's the verse that I should speak about. So look down to verse 27, Proverbs 29, verse 27. An unjust man is abominable to the righteous, and he who is upright in the way is abominable to the wicked. So I was reading that verse, and it struck me. I read it a couple times, and saying, wow, what, what a good verse. An unjust man is abominable to the righteous, and he who is upright in the way is abominable to the wicked. So I was thinking at that time, well, maybe I will attempt to put a message around that verse and uh, bring forth that verse uh, in the message in the next week. But then the more I kept thinking, the more I kept praying, I said, well, you know, I think the message that I already started preparing is what I would like to present about God hears us, how he hears our prayers, and how he answers us. So that's what I went with, and I said, you know what, and I think I might even said in the service that I was going to come back to this verse at some point, and that's what I'll do maybe the next time I fill in. Unfortunately, I did not know I'd be filling in this quickly. So usually I have a couple weeks, I have some notice when I'm going to fill in, and I get a lot of time to kind of get my thoughts together and go through the Bible and compare uh, some scriptures and find some scriptures to present uh, to go with my topic. I found out Friday evening that I was going to be filling in today. So you have to excuse me if uh, this message doesn't come across as well as I, I would like to, um, but it's because I only had one day to prepare. So we pray that God would still bless the message despite the shortcomings of the presenter here this morning. But this is a verse that was actually laid on my heart a couple months ago that I actually wanted to speak about. And we're actually gonna be talking more of the second half of the verse where it says, and he who is upright in the way is abominable to the wicked. So that's what actually hit me. If you're upright in the way, you're going to be abominable to the wicked. Well, what does that mean? What does that mean to be abominable to the wicked? For upright in the way. Basically, what they're saying is, if you're living a righteous life, a life for Christ, if you are not conforming to the world, the wicked and the world are going to hate you. You're going to be abominable to the wicked. So what we're going to be talking about here this morning is something that you probably don't think you're going to hear in church, the call to be abominable. We're called to be abominable. Abominable to the wicked. And that's what we're going to be talking about here this morning. So in this day and age that we live in, people are offended by so many small things. By so many little things. The littlest things offends people. But we are actually to offend the wicked. We're to offend the world. Because they'll see our righteous life and hate us. That's what the Bible says. If we live an upright life, if we walk in an upright manner, the world will hate us. We will be abominable to them. They hate our walk with Christ. They hate the fact that we shine a light on their darkness. They hate that. So if we are walking in an upright manner, as the proverb says, and he was in an upright in the way, is abominable to the wicked. So that's what we're talking about this morning. We're going to be abominable to the wicked. So what are we going to talk about this morning in terms of being abominable? Well, we look at what it actually means to be abominable. So again, as I say every time, to be a good Baptist preacher, you got to have three points and they all got to start with the same letter or something along those lines. I tried to get this uh, wrapped in the sa same letter, so that there's the same uh, uh, letter. So the, the points are being, obviously, to be abominable. First of all, you have to be holy. You're not going to be abominable to the wicked. You're not going to be abominable to the world if you're living just like them. 
So you have to be holy. And then you have to be hated. If you're living an upright life and walking in an upright manner, you're going to be hated by the wicked in the world. And then you'd be helped. Be helped by Christ. Be helped by the Holy Spirit as you face that hate from the world. So the first thing that we're going to be looking at this morning is the fact that we are to be holy. In order to be abominable to the wicked, we must be holy. Live a righteous life. Live an upright life. Live a life that is separated from the world, set apart from the world. Be holy as Christ is holy. So it says in the verse, he who is upright in the way. Well, what is upright in the way? It is set apart. It is holy, living a life pleasing to God, walking in a manner that is pleasing to him. So how can you be abominable to the wicked if you're not doing anything that's separate or different than the wicked? If you confess to be a Christian, and yet you're walking exactly how the rest of the world walks, you're not going to be abominable to the wicked because they don't know that there's any difference. They don't know that you actually are saved. They don't know that you have that relationship with Christ because they don't see a difference. So if you confess to be a Christian, but yet still walk in a manner according to the world and according to what the world says is right, you're not going to be abominable to the wicked. You're not going to be abominable because they don't know that there's a difference. So you have to live a life showing that difference to the world to be holy. And then when you are holy, that's when you would be abominable. So the word says, do not be conformed to the world. A friend of the world is an enemy of God. So if you're living your life in conformity to the world and you are a friend of the world, you're not going to be abominable. But when you are holy and there's a difference and your life is separate and set apart, you'll be abominable to the world. God calls on us to be holy as he is holy. We're going to go through a couple verses here this morning real quick, not getting uh, too uh, deep into them, but the first verse we'd like to look at is 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1. And if you look down to verse 14, 1 Peter. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the former lusts which you were in your ignorance. But like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in all your behavior. Because it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. What does that word say? Be holy as Christ is holy. Do not be a part of the world. Set yourself apart. Do not be conformed to your former lusts, which you were, which were yours, excuse me, in your ignorance. You are not to be conformed to the world. You are supposed to be set apart. Live a holy life as Christ is holy. So to be holy means that we are to put aside the things of the world, not to be conformed to our former lusts, not to be conformed to the sins that we used to live in. He changed us. So our lives should show that change. Our lives should reflect that change in us. Be holy as he is holy. So I should have said when we were, uh, Daniel was reading these scriptures earlier in 1 John chapter 2, you probably want to leave a marker there too, because we were going to turn to 1 John chapter 2. So 1 John chapter 2, where we were reading earlier uh, through the uh, congressional, uh, con congregational uh, reading, and chapter 2, Verse 6, the one who says he abides in him ought himself to walk in the same manner as he walked. So if you're proclaiming to be a Christian, you ought to walk in the same manner as Christ walked. That is to be our example. So if you're going to be a Christian and be holy and be abominable to the wicked, you must walk as Christ walked in the manner that he walked according to his will, according to his word. Now look down to verse 15. We stopped our reading earlier in verse 14, but if uh, you go down to verse 15, we are to do the will of God and not love, our, not love the world. Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. 
If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boasting pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away and all its lusts, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. So we are called to not love the world. We should not be a part of the world. We're in the world, but we are not of the world. We're not of the world's kingdom. We are of Christ's kingdom. So we need to be set apart. We need to show in our lives the love for Christ, not the love of the world. Do not love the world nor the things of the world, because if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. So if you are not showing a life that is holy and pleasing to God, if you're not showing a life that is separate and set apart from the things of the world, you have to question, is the love of the Father actually in you? You're not going to be abominable to the wicked if they can't see a difference. And if they can't see a difference in you, is the love of the Father in you? So walk in a holy manner, in a holy life, pleasing to God. We are to walk in God's will, not in the world's will. We are not to be partakers of worldly things. We are to be partakers of godly things and Christian things, good things from the scripture, set apart from the world. Now turn to the passage we read, I read earlier, uh, James chapter 4. James chapter 4, and I know we've read a lot of these verses, but if you look down to verse 4. You adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture speaks to no purpose? He jealously desires the spirit which he has made to dwell in us. It can't be said any more clear there. Friendship with the world is an enemy of God. So to be abominable to the wicked, you must live a holy life, not a friendship with the world. You don't want to be a friend of the world and an enemy of God. You want to be a friend of God and an enemy of the world. Abominable to the wicked. What would you rather be? An enemy of God or an enemy of the world? So we are called to be abominable to the world, abominable to the wicked. We cannot be both. We cannot be both. You cannot serve two masters. You cannot serve the world and Christ. You cannot sit on the fence. There's so many people that proclaim to be Christians and literally do not do anything different than those in the world. They act the exact same. No one would know the difference. Is that your life? Is that the confession you make? When they talk about you, they say, oh, that, that person goes to church on Sunday morning, but they literally don't do anything else different. They go to church, they put their hour in on Sunday morning. Are you a friend of the world? Or are you a friend of Christ? Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So when we talk about Proverbs 29, 27, talking about an upright, a man in up, or walks in an upright way is abominable to the wicked, I would much rather be abominable to the wicked than an enemy of God. So be abominable to the wicked and be a friend of God. Unfortunately, the next step in being abominable is the fact that if you act that way, you're going to be hated. The world hates those who follow Christ. The world hates us for that. So, to be an abomination requires that we are not friendly with the world. And if we're not friendly with the world, they're going to hate us. So how do we become holy? How do we change our lives to give that testimony to others? Look over to Romans chapter 12, please. Romans chapter 12. Now 
How do we live a holy life so that we are hated by the wicked? Romans chapter 12, starting in verse 1. I urge you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. And then look down to verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. So how do we make ourselves hateful to the world? How do we make ourselves hateful to the wicked? Christ transforms us. Christ renews our hearts. He renews our minds. That we are no longer conformed to the world, but we are transformed by the renewing of our minds, that we may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable. So how do we become hated by the world? Christ transforms us. He comes into our lives. He changes us. He leads us in his way. And then we present our bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to Christ. And then what does it say in verse 9? At that point, then, we abhor, abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Abhorring what is evil. That means we turn our back on the evil. We hate that evil. And when you hate that evil, that evil will hate us. That is how we become abominable. And that is how, unfortunately, the world then hates us. So one more chapter as we look uh, regarding the first part of being holy. Turn over to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. Look down starting at verse 3. But do not let immorality or any impurity or greed even be named among you as is proper among saints. And there must be no filthiness and silly talk or coarse jesting, which are not fitting, but rather giving of thanks. For this you know with certainty that no immoral or impure person or covetous man who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and God. Let no one deceive you. Let no, one, let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of these things the wrath of God comes upon the sons of disobedience. Therefore do not be partakers with them, for you were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light, for the fruit of light consists in all goodness and righteousness and truth, trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. And do not participate in unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead even expose them. For it is disgraceful even to speak of things which are done by them in secret. But all things become visible when they are exposed by the light, and everything that becomes visible is light. For this reason it says, Awake, sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Therefore, be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. And there's the contrast. We are to walk as wise men, not as unwise. The days are evil. When you walk in the light, we are not to participate in the darkness. But instead it says, expose the darkness. You were formerly darkness, but now you are light in the, uh, you are light in the Lord. Walk as children of light trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord. We walk in light. We learn what is pleasing to God when he transforms us, when he renews our minds. We do not participate in unfruitful deeds of darkness, but instead we even expose them. So what happens when you expose darkness to the light? The darkness hates the light. As John says in his gospel in John chapter 1, the light came into the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. The darkness doesn't comprehend the light. So when you shine a light on the darkness by living your life pleasing to the Lord in the manner spoken about in this chapter, it says you were formerly darkness, now you are light. Walk as children of light. This is trying to learn what is pleasing to the Lord, but instead expose them. When you expose their darkness by how you live, when you expose their darkness by your testimony and your walk with Christ, what's the logical conclusion of that? They're going to hate you. The darkness hates the light. The light shines on the darkness and it exposes the darkness. 
So we are to walk as wise men, not unwise, because the days are evil. So we're surrounded by evil. We're surrounded by wickedness. And we are called to be abominable to that wickedness. We are called to shine a light on that darkness. But what is the result of shining that light on the darkness? That's our second point this morning. The darkness, the world, the wicked, they'll hate you. The days are evil when you expose their darkness. The darkness, the wicked, the world, they will hate you. When you walk upright, as the proverb says, when you walk upright, an upright man in his walk will be abominable to the wicked. Abominable to the wicked. We will be hated. A holy life exposes that which is wrong. A holy life exposes that which is wicked. And in return, you're going to be hated. And that's our next point. So in order to be abominable to the wicked, first of all, we must be holy. If you're not living a life holy, if you're not set apart, if they can't tell any difference between you and anybody else in the world, you're not going to be abominable to the wicked. But if you are abominable to the wicked and living that holy life, you're going to be hated. That's what our verse says. An upright man in his walk will be abominable. So what, uh, what, what, what does that mean? It means you will be hated. So unfortunately, we have a recent example here in even our own congregation of, of this happening to them recently. A young man here in the congregation was out a couple weeks ago with friends celebrating a birthday party. And one of the people who was at that birthday party came up to him because he knew some of the other people there. He knew part of his family. And he said, what is it like? to be raised in a religious household. What is it like to be raised in such a religious household? And he responded, he said, well, I loved it. I'm a Christian, so I love being raised in a Christian household. What happened? Did you think this gentleman who was rather inebriated, shall we say, do you think he approved of that? Do you think he accepted that answer? That, well, I love growing up in a religious household because I'm a Christian. Do you think that's what he did? Do you think he accepted and say, oh, well, good job. Tell me more about Christ. No, he laughed in his face, just started mocking him, just mocking him, laughed at him because he said he was happy growing up in a religious household because he is a Christian. So he proclaimed Christ to this person and immediately was laughed, laughed in his face for standing up for Christ. But that's what the Bible tells us to expect. It tells us that the world will hate us for who we are, will hate us for our testimony for Christ. What does the word of God say, or what does the word of God say about this? It says you will be hated over and over and over again. So the gospel that is preached in so many churches these days is saying, oh, come to Jesus, everything will be fine, your life will be perfect, your life will be fine. You can accept him as Savior, but not Lord. You can accept him as Savior, but don't live your life uh, with any change. You can accept him as Lord later. The Bible says, if you are truly saved, you will live your life with a change. And the world will hate you. They're not going to accept you. They're going to hate you. So what does it actually mean to be abominable? Well, Merriam-Webster's Dictionary defines abominable as worthy of or causing disgust or hatred detestable. So in our own verse in Proverbs chapter 29, verse 27, which says, be abominable to the wicked, abominable means worthy of or causing disgust or hatred, detestable. So when we're saying abominable to the wicked, the definition of abominable is hatred, detestable, causing disgust. That is what our testimony should be to the wicked. They see our testimony, we expose their darkness, and they hate us. But is that a surprise? Should that be a surprise to Christians? Look over to 1 John, 1 John chapter 3. Should this be a surprise to Christians? Well, no. God's Word talks about it over and over and over again. And here in 1 John chapter 3 and verse 13, it says, do not marvel, brethren, if the world hates you. Do not marvel. It's a common thing. 
It's known. If, the, if you are a Christian, the world is going to hate you. Do not marvel. Do not be surprised. If you're living your life in a manner pleasing to God, you will be hated by the world. Why is that? Why are they going to hate you? Well, they hate you because the world hated and still hates Christ. They hate you because they hate Christ. That is why they hate you. It is not you. It is Christ living in, living in you that they hate. They do not want their wickedness exposed. So turn to John chapter 15. We'll go from 1 John to the Gospel of John. John chapter 15, verse 18. Very familiar verse and chapter here. John 15, verse 18. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Why do they hate you? They hate you because they hate Christ. If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it had hated you. Well, that's what also in the verse uh, 19 is what we were talking about previously. If you were of the world, they would love you. So if you're acting of the world, if there's no difference between you and the world, if you're not walking in that holy manner, the world would love you. Because it says, if you were of the world, the world would love you. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. So when you're holy, when you're set apart, when you're living a life pleasing to Christ, the world is going to hate you because they see you are not of the world. You are of Christ. The world hates you because they hate Christ. So if the world hates you because they hated Christ, does that mean that we should shrink back? Does that mean we should be quiet about our testimony? Does that mean we shouldn't express our love for Christ to others because we're going to experience that hatred? We're going to experience that mocking? We're going to experience those trials that that brings? May it never be. May it never be. Because as we saw earlier, a friend of the world is an enemy of Christ. So if you shrink back because of the mocking, because of the hatred, and you accept the world and live according to the terms of the world and not of Christ, you're an enemy of God. Those who love the world are an enemy of God. What would you rather be? Would you rather be hated by the world or denied by Christ? The world hates us because of Christ. Turn over a page or two to John chapter 17. John chapter 17. And look down at verse 14. I have given them thy word, and the word I have given them thy word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. So if we confess Christ, they're going to hate us because Christ is not of this world, as we are not of this world. We are in the world but we are not of the world. So we will be hated by all wicked men. So what happens when the world hates us? What happens? We have our testimony. Christ helps us. What happens when they hate us? What happens when they mock us? What happens when we feel bad because we're proclaiming Christ? Well, the good news is God doesn't leave us as orphans, as it says right here in John chapter uh, John chapter 14, verse 18, I will not leave you as orphans, I will come to you. So what happens when we live a holy life and we're hated? God helps us. God promises us that he'll be there for us. God promises us that he will abide with us and he will give us the strength to make it through those trials and those tribulations and that mocking. So when we're holy, we're hated, but then we're helped. When we do what is right in God's sight, 
when we live a life pleasing to God, when we have that testimony to others, when others hate us, God promises that he will help us. If you're still in John chapter 17, look down at verse 15. I do not ask thee to take them out of the world, but keep them from the evil one. In this, this chapter here, Christ is actually praying for his people. Christ is praying for his church. Christ is praying for those that he has chosen out of this world. And he prays for them and says, we're not taking them out of the world, but keep them from the evil one. He promises his love for us. He promises that he would love us and help us through the situation. Look down at verse 26. And I have made thy name known to them and will make it known. And the love wherewith thou didst love me may be in them and I in them. How are we helped through these, these trials? How are we helped through the mocking? How are we helped through the hate, hatred? God says, I will be in them. I will abide with them. He will give us his spirit. He will give us his strength so we may be able to overcome that mocking, overcome that hatred. Look in verse 11 of uh, John 17. And I am no more in the world, and yet they themselves are in the world. And I come to thee, Holy Father, keep them in thy name, the name which thou hast given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. How do we deal with the hatred of the world? God keeps us. God holds us. God abides in us. We have the intercessor. We have the Holy Spirit. We can come to God in our times of trouble. So if we are holy and we are hated, God helps us. He promises us here in this chapter that he will be with us. Uh, he says, uh, keep them in thy name, that how, uh, thy name, the name that which thou hast given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. So how do we overcome this? How are we helped? He keeps us. He abides in us. He gives us that strength. So turn back in your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10. <laughs> Gospel of Matthew, chapter 10. Look down in verse 22. And you will be hated by all on account of my name, but it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. So Christ says here, you will be hated. But what do you do? Do you shrink back? No. You endure to the end. How do you endure to the end? Let's keep on reading here in Matthew, Matthew 10. Look down to verse 26. Therefore, do not fear them. Christ says, do not fear. Do not shrink back. Do not fear. Therefore, do not fear them, for there is nothing covered that will not be revealed and hidden that will not be known. What I tell you in the darkness, speak in the light, and what you hear whispered in your ear, proclaim upon the house, housetops. And do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Are not two sparrows sold for a cent? And yet one of them will, not one of them, will fall to the ground apart from your father. But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Therefore do not fear, you are of more value than many sparrows. Everyone there who shall confess me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever shall deny me before men, I will also deny him before my Father who is in heaven. How are we helped? Christ will be with us. Everyone who confesses me before men, I will confess him before my Father who is in heaven. We're worth more than the sparrows. Do not fear when trials, when tribulations when mocking, when hatred comes upon you, endure to the end. Endure to the end. Do not fear, for God is with you. Do not fear. We're worth more than the sparrows. God will be with us. God will help us. But if you read here, as it says in verse 32, everyone therefore who shall confess me before men, I will also confess him before my Father who is in heaven. Well, that's what we're talking about living a life set apart, confessing Christ before men. But verse 33 is something that uh, has been near and dear to my heart for many, many years. And when you actually look at the verse, it, it is a very, very sobering verse because it says, whoever shall deny me 
before men, I will also deny him before my father who is in heaven. So it goes back to our question. Would you rather be a friend of the world and deny Christ and be an enemy of Christ? Or would you rather be a holy life, live a holy life and be hated by men, but be accepted by Christ? Not denied by him because you have failed to confess his name, but accepted by him because you have proclaimed his name throughout your life. So, what would you rather be? Friends with the world or friends with Christ? Because even if we are hated living a holy life, God will help us and he will confess us to the Father who is in heaven. We'll look over to one more verse. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6. Luke chapter 6, look down at verse 22. Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you and cast insult at you and spurn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in that day and leap for joy, for behold, your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way their fathers used to treat the prophets. What does God say about mocking, about casting insults, about being hated by the world? What does Jesus say here in this verse? Blessed are you. When was the last time that you got mocked or made fun of and you stood back and said, wow, I feel really blessed about that. I feel so happy and joyful that I am being made fun of, that I'm being mocked. But that's what God says here. That's what Jesus says here. Blessed are you when men hate you and ostracize you, and cast insults at you, and spurn your name as evil for the sake of the Son of Man. Be glad in that day, and leap for joy. Why? Because you have a reward in heaven. You have Christ as your reward. Even though you're being made fun of, even though you're being mocked, even though you're ostracized, even though they're casting insults at you, you have the reward in heaven. You have Christ. And that's what we're talking about here today. Are you abominable to those around you? Do you have a testimony with your coworkers, with your family, with your classmates, with your neighbors, with your friends? What is your testimony to them? Are you abominable to the wicked? Are you abominable to those who hate Christ? Or do you just fit in? Do you just live your life according to the world and not profess or proclaim the name of Christ? Because if you are and you are hated, be comforted, be glad, rejoice in that, because Christ will help us. God promises you he will help you. So what are we to do with that? What are we to do with our testimony? As uh, the Gospel of Matthew says in Matthew chapter 5, I think I actually preached a sermon on this a couple years back, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. So that is what our testimony should be. We should be abominable to the wicked. So our light shines on that darkness, as we saw earlier in this message. Shine in the darkness. When light shines in the darkness, the darkness is exposed. The wicked will hate you. But you know what? If you live your life and you have your testimony and you proclaim Christ, there are those who might come to know Christ in your life due to your testimony. It says, let your light shine before men, that others may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. So through your life, through your testimony, while the world might hate you, those chosen of God could be waiting for you to proclaim his word to them. Your light could be the light in that darkness that leads them to Christ. So live your life, proclaim Christ. Yes, be holy. Be holy, live a life pleasing to Christ. And you may be hated for it, but God promises his help. So what do we do with that? We're joyful. We're glad. Be joyful. Be glad. Your reward in heaven is great. So even though we're hated, even though we're abominable to the wicked, our reward in heaven is great. We have a great savior. We have a great reward out of this world in Christ's kingdom. Do not try to please the world. Do not try to fit in. Do not try to be friends with the world and an enemy to God, 
but be a friend of God and an enemy to the world. So, as our passage in Proverbs 29, 27 states, as our passage in Proverbs 29, 27 states, and he who is upright in the way is abominable to the wicked. Be upright in the way. Be abominable to the wicked. Yes, we are talking here today about being abominable to the wicked. We are not to just fit in. We are not just to capitulate to everybody. We are not just to do things so we don't offend others. We are to be abominable. So be holy. Live your life being holy. Wear it as a badge of honor. Wear it with pride that you are holy, that you are walking in a manner worthy of Christ, pleasing him in all respects. Be holy. Be hated. If you, act ho if you walk in a holy manner, you will be hated. So be holy. Be hated. But know that when that happens, you will be helped. So be abominable, as the Proverbs say. Be abominable to the wicked. Let's pray. God, we pray that you would be with us, be with those in the congregation, be with our testimonies, God. Let our light shine so that others might see the difference in us, that it might even be that testimony to others that would lead them to you. God, we pray that we would be set apart, that we would live a life that is holy and pleasing. And God, we pray that our light would actually shine in the world. This is a dark world, a world full of evil. That is what your scriptures say. Your scriptures have said for thousands of years that we live in an evil time and that the darkness does not like the light. When the light shines on the darkness, the darkness hates the light. So God, please let us be that light despite being hated, but despite being mocked, despite the consequences here in this worldly life and know full well that in the end, we will be rewarded in you, God. Thank you for that message. Thank you for your scriptures. Thank you for the hope that we have in you. Pray this in your name. Amen.